Um, good morning, everybody. As we as you give people a chance to come on in the come on in the room, this I guess will be the when when it plays on YouTube too. Um, there will be um, this will be what you see as well. Um, I'm, I I have this up on my computer screen too, and it hasn't like shown us up yet. So I don't know how far behind it is. There it goes. All right, there it goes. Hey everybody, we're on. Um, yes, on delay. Last show of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, this is becoming like. Do you remember when um, you're a Duke fan or a Carolina yeah. fan? Duke fan. I feel like we've always had that in common. So yeah, many things. Yeah, yeah the many things we have in common, we're both fans of Duke, which actually makes us in the minority from the state that we're from because Tar Heels. Exactly. Right. Yeah, even though Duke's been the more successful program. For the last years, for sure. I mean, pretty much, I mean, pretty much while we've been alive, Duke has been the more successful program. So it's, it's, that didn't start, though, until, like, Leitner, really, like the Leitner-Hurley time, like, 1991. We're, like, 10 years old, and we're in our 40s now, yeah. so it's still a long it, time. <laughs> So I guess when you most of our life, I guess you're not wrong about that. But Carolina has been pretty good for most of the most of that time too. Um, I don't no, want they've to. Been, they've been sure. great. Since, they've been great since the '60s. They've yeah. been great since the mid '80s and really started apex in the early '90s. Um, Just started what, 80, 81, 82, like that kind of time, right? That was his yeah. first. Shashevsky started. Hold on, you're you're born in '80, right? '81. You're '81. Yeah, that's Shashevsky started the year we were born. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, do you remember when they used to call it the Coach K Invitational, like the Final Four? Yeah. That's what my year in hip hop wrap ups are turning into. They're turning into the Nas Invitational yeah. the last three years because I find myself either, I mean, two years ago, about two, two years and about a week ago, he dropped Magic One. Right. I remember that. And, um, all of, according to hip hop's year in wrap ups, I mean, he's pretty much, you know, he's pretty much been Michael Jordan on the three peat, you know. Yep. And so, this ending this year talking about Magic Three is appropriate because really the way that I've ended the last few years has been, you know, talking about the greatest MC of all time because he's quite frankly dropped the album of the year, in my opinion, three straight years. That's unfortunate. Which is actually unprecedented, like not even for his age, like period. Yeah, like nobody's dropped album of the year three straight years because nobody's really made an album three straight years that's even worthy of being in contention like that. You know, it used to be hip hop, hip hop years used to work that you usually dropped every like 18 to 24 to 27 months. So the pace that he's working at is extreme, but that's what makes it more astounding is actually the quality of it. I know a lot of people have Killer Mike's Michael as album of the year. So my first thing that I wanted to ask you actually was, did you actually um, listen to the albums back to back like I did? Before we um, get I, I have not listened to them like consecutively. This morning, um, I listened to Magic 2 and 3 back to back. Um, and honestly, so let me take a step back. I listened to Magic 3 again last night and then 2 and 3 again this morning. Oh, this is cough medicine, by the way. I'm not drinking. Like <laughs> not drinking at 11 in the morning. Um, so, so I listened to Magic 3 last night, and it was one of those nights that didn't land, really, for me. I don't know why. It just wasn't. But I was like, am I going to have to come on here? in the morning and say or argue that killer mics is better like am i going to have to do that and then i listened to it again this morning and i was like okay now, now I, I kind of got in the in the groove i guess i guess i just wasn't in the mood um last night or whatever it just wasn't wasn't that time now you want to know what's crazy is that I, the, I the argument that two is as good or better like i, I think i could do that but but yeah i think let's have I, we well, let's have a conversation. I think, hold on. Well, I think that makes it conversational, actually, because guess what? Like, when I went and listened to Magic 3, mm -hmm. like, back to back, like, some of that happened to me. It's actually, here's what I realized. I realized that it's like, 
I feel like I feel like the executive production on Michael might be better. Mm-hmm. I think beat for beat, it's not better, although it is more the type of music that you would ride to. See, for me, I look at production on two levels. I think sometimes people look at production like, well, that's the shit that I want to ride to. And it's like, I look at production on that level too, but I also look at, at does this beat fit what the artist is trying to accomplish on the record? And from that respect, I can see how in tune Nas and Hit Boy are because the things that Hit Boy was trying to accomplish worked with the themes and the scope of what Nas was trying to deliver. Mm-hmm. Well, so think, right. So I think the production jobs are comparable. Mm-hmm. But and, and I think this might be some Southern shit, too. You know, Southern music is more rate made to ride to than East Coast yeah. music. It is. And Michael has more of a ride factor than Magic 3. And Magic 3 kind of like... Magic 3 doesn't have a lot of up-tempo stuff. Right. It's actually very melodic and very like... Some of the production is sparse, but it's intentional. Right. And because of that, <clears throat> if you're not fully awake, like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not up, up, which you probably weren't when you listened to it, mm-hmm. it sounds as if there's not enough pace to the album. Especially yeah. the early part, you know? And so I, but this is one of the things where I'm like, no, it's conversational whether it's album of the year, but there are just some moments for me that it separates itself, like the ending of the album, like, because, mm-hmm. and you know, and it's kind of unfair to Mike because they're ending the series with this album ender. It feels more of like a complete album ender than the way Killer Mike's album been. You know what I'm saying? Oh. Um, and Killer Mike is telling the story about the girl he used to be in love with on Slummer. No, it's a beautiful story. It's not based on true events part one and two, though, storytelling wise. Do you get what I'm saying? No. That's some that's other shit, right? I mean, that's like that's a a mobster story. Like you could turn those into movies. Those were those are movies, right? Both of them. Yeah, the shit is cinematic, like truly, like movie script type of stuff. And it's one of those things that those become the separate moments. Speechless part two. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so there's some. There. Yeah, so there are some moments where I feel like magic separates itself, although it doesn't have the rhythm and the ride factor that Michael does. Yeah. I agree with Born Gifted. And plus, the second half of magic is like a steamroll. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's they, the two albums, if we're talking about Killer Mike, talking about Michael and talking about Magic 3, they kind of go like that, right? I mean, what three accelerates and, and Ma- Michael has the bangers at the beginning and kind of tails. Right. The albums are actually kind of flipped. It's like the first five songs on Magic are good, but they're really more momentum building towards yeah. him rolling the second half of the album. Michael hits you in the face. Yep. on the first five or six records. Yes, and then does. after that, it starts to descend. I've always been of the train of thought that, like, first of all, they both have great album starters. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I was going to say, Fever is great. I, lo- I love that song. Fever yeah. is great. Fever is actually, you know, of the six albums, I would say that Fever might be the best album starter outside of Speechless, part one. Yeah, the, the, the uh, speech. Speechless one and two might be two of my favorite songs on the whole series. Like that's, I love those two songs. They're so. I good. would agree. Like if we're going through the seventy some odd songs, both of those songs would be top twenty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. If Speechless two. Yeah. I mean, Speechless two is pretty fucking great. <laughs> they're but they're both really really good, and they frame two and three too, right? Like because one of them's at the very beginning, and one of them's it's not exactly all the way at the end, but it's close to the end of I mean, the three. I mean, it goes. It's, I think Speechless Part Two, Japanese Soul Bar, and then the closeout, one eight hundred Nas and Hit. So it does. It's, it's, it's kind of like rolling the credits, though, right? I mean, it's a song too, but they're like it's rolling credits at the end. Yeah, one eight hundred Nas and Hit actually comes off like a freestyle to me. Like they just wanted to do an album closer, yeah. You know, what I'm saying and a series closer, and it's like mm-hmm. you know, just like play some shit and let me talk to him for a little bit while we ride this out. So for me, Jack. <laughs> 
Japanese soul bar song is like the pulling out shot at the end. Like yeah. you see the guy sitting at the bar who's kind of pulling the the camera back and back and back. It's it's that right? I mean it. it yeah. I mean they're both great songs, but like that's that's the effect of it, right? Well, see, okay, so this is why Magic Three is album of the year over Michael though is that like <laughs> going and getting a sample from a Nas live show before Illmatic ever comes out. And then implementing it at the end of this run in hip hop's 50th year while he's turning 50. And there's no promise or guarantee that he's going to make an album again because he really doesn't fucking have to. Yeah. You know, there's something about that where where it's like, well, if this is the last time we hear him on a full length project, those are the types of things that you want pulled out. It's like right. I got this guy from Queens, his name is Nas. It's like it's like, you know, the 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 it, the sample that hit pulled, it's like, you know, it makes you realize it's like, yeah, this guy was once unknown. Yeah. You know, and, and using oh, that as a big, big full circle moment. We were talking about other full circle moments with Speechless and whatever else, but that's like the big full circle. Right. right? Well, 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 to start off with Fever, which literally is essentially his birthday song anthem, his 50th right. birthday song anthem, and then it ended it with Japanese Soul Bar, which is really recounting the memories of a 17, 18 year old kid performing live. Yeah. You know, like that, that's that production on another level. Yeah. You know, where it's like, no, you're getting the full story being told to you, you know? <laughs> and so those were the types of separating moments, even though I feel like Michael has more of a ride factor. I've never based an album of the year on Ride Factor. It can put you in contention like uh, the night shift with Larry June and Cardo. It's like, no, I love to ride to that shit. That's a, that's a good ride now. That's that's a late night riding album, right? It that's is. A, no, I, when I'm on the way home from work, I can just like... It, it, it's, it's interesting to, see, to hear now, like, I, I am not familiar with the culture a ton, obviously, because I did not grow up in it, but like, I'm... I'm starting to see some of these things now. Like this is, so, so they're not just ride factor albums. They're ride factors like on different times of day too. Like um, my, Michael, you can do like any time of day, but it feels to me like an afternoon kind of, mm-hmm. kind of like going out to dinner. I mean, that kind of time, like that kind of day. But, and, and Larry <laughs> feels like I'm coming home from work at, late at night kind of, or. You can work out to Michael too. I think that's something. Exactly. That- that, that factors into some of its album of the year contention is that it's like, no, you can ride the Michael, but you can kind of work out the Michael too. Like you're not going to work out the magic three. No, it's not. No. It's, it's not. excellent. But that's, uh, yeah, the intent is different, right? Yeah. The intentions are different. Definitely. Um, you know, um, both of them are unique to their regions in the sense that, well, What Hit Boy really did production wise was get into the beat breaks. Yeah. And, and the samples. Well, that's tri- that's traditional East Coast hip hop. Okay. What Killer Mike did was really get into the bass line. Yeah. <laughs> that bass line. The bass line, yeah. the church, the 808. Well, that's Southern. And yeah. so they're both accomplishing their respective missions. And and I hate to say it, and this is where he keeps winning. It's like a lot of the time it comes down to well, who's the better MC? And, and, th- and that was not even close. No disrespect to Mike, but like, <laughs> like that's not even. Like, no, like, so what I mean when who's the better MC, it's like, well, who has the better voice? It's like over there. Who's the better storyteller? It's like, oh, over there. Who has the better delivery? It's like, oh, over there. Who has better concepts? It's like, uh, even though Michael concepts are great, it's like over there. And that's where it becomes album of the year. And that's why it's like for people the same Michael's the album of the year. It's like, no, I understand exactly what you're saying. But at the point that it becomes conversational, I'm going to lean on the album. I'm going to lean on the MC. Magic is more complete. Magic 3 is more complete as an album from end to end, I feel like. And the MC and the MC is better. And that's where I'm going to kind of like leave it. But I did kind of want to gauge your thoughts on what 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 on Magic Three stood out to you? I know we talked about some tracks. Like, what stood out to you? Um, yeah, the help, the help matters too, TJ. I always tell people like the help yeah. is like I don't even have to go to the help like because it's like well we can go to the MC and stop right there. But then if you want to couple the help with it, it's like well one guy spit out about forty versus one guy spit out about twenty. Yeah. 
this, and, and that does matter in this conversation, right? Yeah, that, it matters. Like it's it's one of those things when um uh a guy that I went to junior high with uh, uh Randell Randell hit me up one day on Facebook. It's probably like maybe four or five years ago, and he's like, "Coop is Black Thought a better lyricist than Nas?" I'm like. I'm like, and keep in mind, this is before the magic run that I right. said. So I wouldn't say this necessarily now, but I was like, yes, but only because he has not produced the volume of material that Nas has produced, as in he has not taken his pen and gone into the well and giving out as many verses to the public as Nas has. Because at that point, Black Thought had maybe done one solo EP and just the Roots projects, right. which... Recording wise is about half of the work that Nas has done. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so it's one of those things that it's like, well, if it's comparable, you know, like Nas is like on solo project number ugh, and his, something like that, right? I don't even a bunch. I think it's like sixteen or seventeen at this point. Right. And it's like you can put Killer Mike's albums, run the jewels project, and guess verses together. And it may not even be half of that. Right. And so you do have to look at that. It's kind of like a ball player where it's like, well, part of what makes LeBron special is, is that like, do you understand this guy's played more minutes than somebody like, how about this? You can go to his own team. It's like, look at how many minutes he's played in his career in respect to Anthony Davis. And he's still clearly the better player than Anthony Davis. Like still at this point, it's like, you're still better than Anthony Davis after all these jumps, after all these plays. Yeah. And so, like, shit like that matters. You know what I'm saying? It does. Yeah. It's like, if you look at who the best players are right now, it's like, well, look at their age. Like, Jokic, Embiid, and Luka yeah. are all under 30. LeBron is 39 years old, averaging 25, 7, and 7. Yeah. Uh, KD and Steph are 35, averaging third, like, Katie's averaging 37 and 6. He's 35. It's like, yeah. I know he's not, I know those two guys aren't the one and two like they've been for most of their career. And for, but they're still but, up there, though. But they're still both top 10 players, and let's see what those guys who were number one, two, and three like look like at 35, because I guarantee you, Luka Doncic at 35 will not be averaging 30 points again. No. Now, and, and Kevin Durant, I mean, I've, I've said this many times. I've said it to you, too, that Kevin Durant could be Sam Perkins and could play until he's 50 just as a standstill shooter. Like, like he's, he's tall enough to be a functional uh, guarding people. I mean, he's not going to be quick at that age. But, like, if his ankles hold up or whatever, I mean, the, the shooting's not going to go away. Like, he's, he could play – he the could be a standstill shooter forever if you, you want to. What's crazy is that I could actually see him because he's probably – I mean, he's not going to – in about two or three years, if he's still playing, I could see him being one of the league leaders in assists because of the threat of his jump shot. Yeah. But the fact that he physically won't be able to do some things will force him into more of a pass mode. Yeah. Like, they've been losing in the last couple of games they've won, and he's had 16 assists and 11 assists because he understands that maybe on this team, the threat of him scoring mm -hmm. is so frightening to people still that if he'll give that ball up and maybe, you know, sacrifice the 27 to 30 points a game and go down to about 22 to 25, but go up in assists from about five or six to about eight or nine or 10, that that might make them more viable and make him more viable. Yeah, they have and, players on that team that can score. Like, that's not that's not an issue on that team. They have scores, they have scores especially if Bradley Beal is healthy. But I say that to say is, is that, well, Nas is more like KD or LeBron at this stage. It's like, you're still fucking doing this at this level? Like, 35-year-olds don't average 30 points in the NBA. 39-year-olds don't average 25, 7, and 7. And, and so... LeBron also um, is very clearly dialing it back and saving himself for the playoffs and whatever. He's not, he's not going full tilt. He could he could average 30, whatever, if he wanted to. Like, yeah, he could average 30 he, till February, but then he would get hurt. Yeah. Yeah, because... He's, he's still sure. for the playoffs, but... Yeah. I mean, not to be funny, but it's like I know the in-season in tournament really doesn't mean a damn thing to me. But there is something to be said that it's like, nah, he went hard for about four, five, or six games. And his going hard for about four, five, or six games is still better than everybody else four, five, or six games. Which he makes him still got it. 
He still got yeah, it. That, well, that makes him a legitimate threat to win any playoff series still because it's like if he can still get into his bag for four out of seven games, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the playoff problem for him is going to be doing it three or four series in a row, not like not not series. He could. I, I'm not convinced that he can't beat anybody in one series, but yeah. like yeah. doing it over and over. Like, can he do like, it? Six, was it 16 games? Right, and for the for the series, right? Yeah. So, like, that's that's the that's to me is the question. Like, if the Clippers were to get the Lakers in the first round, the Clippers are going home. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, lights out. Yeah, because he. Like, yeah, because he'll do them four series because they have nobody for him because Kawhi can't guard like he used to. They yeah. literally have nobody for him and AD. They go home. They beat them in six games because LeBron, for about two, three, or four games, could totally dominate them, you know? And AD has that gear. He doesn't use it really very often, but 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 it is there. Like, he, he can do 40-10, like, 40-10, yeah. like, do that. I mean, I mean – not being funny, Anthony Davis should be doing what Embiid and Jokic are doing on a regular basis, Absolutely. and there's really no excuse why he's not. But <laughs> he's, I mean, there's not there's not any fucking excuse. Like yeah. seriously, he's a better he's a better shooter than Jokic. He's a better rebounder than him, and he's a better defensive player than both of them. Yeah, he is a defensive he's player. A, he's a better rebounder than Embiid. He's a I, better. I'm a better shooter than Jokic, but like, um, that, that's that's questionable. But like, um, no. He's a better shooter because Jokic, Jokic gets a lot of his points on offensive rebound and little baby hooks and putbacks. It's like Jokic mid-range game isn't like Anthony. Like, Anthony Davis can literally take you 15 feet and, like, spin you, turn you, fade. Like, yeah, no, Jokic can't do that. No. No, he, he's a better spotter, I think. Like, he's, he's threes and shooting, whatever. Um, I remember watching. I forget who they were playing. It was about a week ago now. Um and somebody forgot to guard Jokic about like three feet behind the three point line, and he stood there for a second, and kind of looked around, like, "You guys are really gonna let me shoot this?" <laughs> and and it, yeah, but when you are absolutely correct that AD AD should be part of that conversation, like he should absolutely, and Cat too should be, um, both of them should be like part of that um, that group, like that they should be part of that thing, right? Yes, but, every night. Every night, 30 and 12. Every night. Every night. Not some nights. Not once a week. Not once every two weeks. Every night. Every yeah. night they keep doing it. Yeah. Um, but what, what are some of the highlights? I want, you know, I mean, because we talked about Michael last week mm-hmm. and talked about like the high moments that really make it album of the year contender. We talked about the moments that maybe may keep it from winning album of the year. What are the things, in your opinion, that <laughs> may make people say that Magic 3 is not album of the year? Because there are a lot of people that feel like that Magic Two in a vacuum is better, and you even pose that. I, I feel like that honestly, like, or at the very least, it's like your Fredo and Pray for Paris conversation. Like, is is that like which one? Of, if if you're asking me which one is better, that's a conversation, right? This is a debate that we can have, um, and I don't know that I know enough or I've listened to it enough to be able to make a real solid argument one way or the other but but what i can say for myself is that if i am just listening if i'm like pulling one of them to listen to like around the house or or whatever um i'm probably picking two over three like that's that's the one that i'm picking like personally my personal yeah. take yeah so so but explain to me why you feel that way because i think sometimes the biggest attraction maybe for magic three being album of the year is that it doesn't necessarily have the highs that Magic Two has? That, that that would be my argument, right? I mean, that would be, um, it's it's I mean, Magic Two is shorter. It's how many ten songs? Yeah. Ten, right? Um, and um, it's there. There's more, or to my memory anyway, more like beat changes within the songs. I mean, some of it I've listened to Magic Two closer to. That's one of the arguments that I've had on the show before is that a lot of the things that we love the most, um, we love the most because we've spent mo- more time with them too. I um, mean, it's, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? I mean, you can say, um, I spent more time with this because I like it better because it is better. Or you can say that, that I have, I like it better because I've spent more time. Like it kind of goes in a circle and they kind of, those two things kind of reinforce each other, um, so to speak. But um and I've spent more time with 
to because I did a whole reaction series to every song on that record. Um, so I, I've listened to it much more closely than than Magic Three. Um, it is. I, I love the beat changes within the songs. Um, I, I love. I, th I think there are more types of flows on Magic Two, at least to my memory. Uh, right. Maybe about that. Um, he's just. It's, it's like the Boy Genius album to me. He's doing more different things in a smaller amount of space. How about this? I think, <clears throat> you know, it's almost like, you know, uh, Skip Bayless used to say about Michael Jordan, I watched him for like 10 or 11 straight years do something different every night that I had never seen before. Yeah. That's kind of like what Magic 2 is in a sense. It's like yeah. the the risk taking factor is like high. Yeah. And that was the success rate. But there's something about it that doesn't feel like a full album because of that. Does that make sense? I want you to say more about that. I don't know that I completely followed that. Okay, so like Michael has a theme. Yeah. Magic three has a theme. Okay. Magic, it's a movie. yeah, Ma yeah. Magic, Magic Three is ri it's written like a screenplay. Yeah, the whole thing is. Yeah, it's a big screenplay, and I, th I think it's intentional. Magic Two is almost like them pulling up to the studio, like on their Harlem Glo Globe Trotter shit, or like when Iverson first came into the league. Shit, it's like, man, look at all this shit I can do. You know, I, I, I can hundred percent. Yeah. And, and because of that, I think it actually takes some of the album feel away because it's like, how about this? Of all the series mm -hmm. between King's Disease and between Magic, Magic 2 is the one that fits the theme the most between all six projects okay. because it is the one that feels magic. the most like Magic, correct? I think that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Yeah. Like, look at all this shit that I can do. And, and he's not only, he's not copying other people in there. I don't want to hear people to hear me say that, but he is saying, I can do this better than him. I can do this better than him. I can do this and I can do this better than, like, he's, he's taking people's, the things that they're known for in there. And he's, he's not showing them up, but he's saying like, I can do this too. I can do this shit too. And I can do it as well or better than than that. No, that's exactly what motion is. It's like, it's like, man, I make this vibe shit better than the kids who are supposed to be making the vibe shit. Exactly. You know what and I'm saying? That. I love that. I love that. Yeah, like, you know, it's funny. One of the things that um, the plug Taj told me about Office Hours with 50 Cent was that, you know, first of all, I still like 50's verse on there. I feel like he brings some great energy to the yeah. song. But Taj was like, she was telling me one day, she was just like, what is 50 supposed to rap about after all of those verses that Nas just did? He yeah. just covered everything. And he covered it like like rhyme-wise. Like, that's where you're talking about. It's like what other people can do. It's like, oh, no, that's not his rap style. No, it's not. Yeah, he's not even, like, I think part of why I like Slow It Down so much is because it's the Nas song on Magic 2. Yeah. The rest and of the song. Like it's not quite two different songs, but there's two different distinct things that he's doing too. Yeah, I have to slow it down for you, and then he does slow it down. For right. You. Like, if yeah. I have to slow it down, I won't laugh at you. You yeah. know, he's like, "Are you watching all this shit that I'm doing?" You know, what I mean, you know, I can do everything, right? And that's why it's like magic. That's why when the album starts off with Abracadabra, is Fever better than Abracadabra to me? It's like yes. But as far as spinning the theme, starting off Magic 2 with Abracadabra, in the way that he's like literally laughing at the end of the track, like, yeah, like it's almost like it's like it's him saying, This is not a game to me, but playing yeah. with y'all is a game to me. Because yeah. none of y'all do all the stuff that I can do at this stage in the game, you know? Yeah. And so I think some of that, like pulling off the magic trick for every song. Yeah. Hurts the concept and the album feel because the concept is there, but because you're doing every single thing, the cohesion of it. You get what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Like, I think I, I could argue that that doing that on every song 
successfully um is a theme sort of like like that that is the theme right it is um show it is showing off and i I'd, like for me that's enjoyable to listen to and a couple of people have said this in the comments as well like um the two albums are for different moods right they're for different times and they're for different things like um I, I, magic three is to me a godfather movie like that kind of thing oh. it is the story of his life it is the story um of him like <clears throat> at 50 looking back on the things that he's done um <clears throat> sort of nostalgically but also talking about his life in like present tense like he's talking about like what's happening right now too which is why um japanese soul bar hits the way it does is because you're you're it's like you're zooming in on the guy sitting at the bar and it kind of slowly pans out right and it's slowly panning out and that's the end of the thing right you see the guy sitting at the bar um and the cool part about that is i mean that's how sort of how the sopranos ends like that i mean that kind of thing right i mean right. that he, he's making maybe not explicit references to those things but those types of things and that and the cool part is that could be the last that could be the end of the story or it could be like there could be the end of this part of the story and we could have godfather four or right does it make sense like there could be another right. so, so so here's part of the reason why i enjoy the ending the magic three so much like to the whole Godfather thing, it's like you remember how Godfather One ends, where you know Kay is kind of being left in the background, and you know uh, Clemenza and everybody is like coming together and kissing the ring. Yeah, I mean, I think the Godfather Part Two ending with Michael just sitting there at the end on the estate, sitting by himself, and you can tell how just all the gangster shit has aged him. In the Magic Three is like the opposite of that. It's like. It's yeah. Yeah, it's like no, he's going out like on top without sorrow. He's not sitting there alone. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like a beautiful thing to me. Like Pistols on your album cover is a better song than one eight hundred nines and hit, but it's not a better ending. And 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 just and this is like another splitting hairs thing. I feel like the Black Magic song, although I like it, and although it fits the theme of the album perfectly on Magic Two. Mm -hmm. The, the song isn't as good as the other records. Okay. And then Urban Magic Johnson is probably one of the weakest beats Hit Boy has done in this entire run, if not the weakest beat. And then you go to the fact that I don't think that they, and, and this is something he doesn't normally do, the fact that the Nas and 21 Savage, One Mic, One Gun is like the bonus song at the end. I don't love that. And that's the, I've always thought that that was not necessary. Like it's there's right. just a, yeah. right. So it's like Magic Three doesn't really have moments like that. Yeah, and that's the difference to me, and that's what keeps Magic Two for like Black Magic, Urban Magic Johnson, and One Mic One Gun are what keep Magic Two from being album of the year to me because. If we're just going song for song, like with the rest of the record, Abracadabra, Office Hours, Motion, Bokeem Woodbine, what this all really means, Slow It Down, Pistols on Your Album Cover. Oh, no. Those other eight songs are washing anybody else's album with eight yep. songs. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's not another album that has eight songs like that on it this year. Right. So what we're arguing is the highs of Magic 2 are higher, but the low also lower. Yeah, like when it's low... It's low. And also, too, I feel like he missed an opportunity. And this is, once again, fitting into the theme, but maybe not helping. The fact that he actually made Black Magic one of the singles. Yeah. And then the video really, the video was good, but it wasn't like all that. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, I'm going to take that into consideration and like dock a couple points for it. Okay. Yeah, because it's like, I mean, I don't know about you. It's like Abracadabra could have been a single. Motion definitely. Yep. That's the one. The first time I listened to that album, that's the one that jumped out at me. Like slow it down's the most visual. It's like when he goes into the end. I pulled up in Iceland just to sightsee this new mink on me pricey. Da, 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 da. Yeah, man, I right. might turn up my shit like I'm iced tea. There's a whole visual aid video to that that would have been nice to go zoom to the end of the video and just kind of have him on like a flat terrain in Iceland, 
where it's all cold and he's in a black mink and you know they could have digitized it and permed his hair. You know what I'm saying? It's like no, those are those are some missed opportunities in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? I can see that. I, I, that's the conversation that I really wanted to have today. Is like, um, what the difference is between the two are to you, and like, wow, you think one is better than the other. I mean, that's the that's the real conversation. And I think Michael's the third piece of the conversation. Like, what? It's not. I don't think it's album of the year, but I do think it is a, a reasonable thing to discuss anyway. So. Yeah. There's three. Those are the three pieces, and like I, I follow your argument now. Like I, I see, I see what you're saying, especially the cinematic part. Like because right. Magic Three is a story, is not just a story, a series of stories, but it is also a larger story from end to end. Yeah, yeah. It starts off with a birthday celebration, and it ends at Japanese Soul Bar, taking you back to when he's like literally like a Ron Phenom as a teenager. You know what I'm saying? And then it's got like, and then it's got like the make you feel good outro that you don't normally get from rapping. You know what I'm it's saying? It's a celebration. It is. It's a celebration. Yeah. It's like rolling the credits. It absolutely is rolling the credits. That's what it it's is. Like it's like a legit credit roll on an album. And the only other album that I can think of it does that as well as the way Jay Z ends the Black album with um my first song. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Like, like that's the way you want to hear your icons kind of like drop the mic, like literally. It's like, no, if that's how you're leaving me, like, leave me like that. You know, like when he's like, hit us up, we might spin the block on you again. I'm like, you see what I'm saying? Like, you, you know, usually when a 50-year-old guy is saying spin the block, you're like, shut your old ass up. Yeah. But, but he's in such a place that it's like, you're kind of borderline like, yeah, spin the block on us again. Andrew? Andrew? Uh-oh. Technical difficulties. I'm going to pull up Magic 3 right quick, the track listing, so we can go through it while Andrew is working out his kinks. Actually, let me text Andrew make sure he's all right. Okay. You said you're here? Yeah, we can't see you. There I can we. hear it. Okay. It unfroze. Good. I need to – I want to see if I can – I don't know if I'm going to be able to put on Do Not Disturb. While it, you know, I'm, if it crashes the stream, guys, I'm sorry. I'll be, I'm going to be right back. No, no, no. You're fine. All right. Frozen out. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. okay. We're, I think we're now. I, I, I got to remember to put on D&D &D on, my, on my phone before we start this out. So, because that's what was happening. I think that was what was happening to you last time was, was yeah. people. Which is crazy because it's like. Everybody knows, like, I mean, Saturday, like, if people were to do it now, I would understand it more because I actually work today. But people yeah. know, people know that Monday and Wednesday are like my podcast days. Like, the people in my life know. Yeah. It's like, you should know to text me by now. It's been like two or three years of this shit. Yeah, that exactly. No, like, I, and, and when you're at work and stuff like that, too, I, I mean, I, I text you all the time to think when I think of things and to just share ideas with you or whatever. But, like, I don't ever expect you to, like, stop what you're doing and respond to me, like, when you're at work or whatever. Like, like I, I send it and I, like, I know you'll get to it when you get to it. It's not a thing. Like, You know, there, there are some people, you know, and not a lot of people that bought up that, like, the way Nas is talking on Pretty Young Girl and on Blue Bentley. Mm-hmm. That it's like, man, this dude's fifty. His daughter's grown. Why is he talking about scooping up two chicks and like all this, that, and the other? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, is it still okay for him to be a bachelor and talk like a bachelor at fifty, or do we expect more from him? Is maybe it's because the expectations for him are so unrealistic? Yeah. Are you asking me, or are you? Yeah, I'm asking you. Like, um, what's your take on? It? Like. If I'm being honest, like the the player talk songs, I know that's part of like the culture or whatever. Like those don't land as well to me than than as the others do. Like that's just my personal, like coming from my personal, like where I am in life. But I'm not 50 and I'm a bachelor, so like I don't have the same. I'm not, I'm not living the same life either. So like, I feel like independent of me, like artistically, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Like that's. Like artists, artists can do whatever they want. Like that's not, um, I, I don't have any judgment about that. Like he, he, he does, 
he live his life however he wants to. He doesn't seem to be hurting anybody. He doesn't seem to be like whatever. I mean, that, that's us. That's his. That's his world. Like I'm. I'm just saying for myself. I want to be. I want to be clear to, to like split this line. Um, those songs don't land as well to me personally, but I don't have an issue with him doing it. Does that make sense? Does it not land with you because of where you are? Yeah, I think so. It's harder yeah. for you to relate. Yeah. See, I, I kind of feel that way too. First of all, I love Pretty Young Girl because that's him rapping like Ghostface. Oh, okay. Which is like almost impossible to do. Like people, like that's what I mean about like this guy can do anything. It's like, he sounds like Ghostface Killer on there. Raekwon doesn't sound like Ghost and they've been rapping together since they were teenagers side by side. It's like, how the hell is this guy doing stuff like this? So sometimes I look at the degree of difficulty Okay. and maybe sometimes I get too intricate into it. And quite frankly, I like the beat because it, it sounds looks like, like Coop got all in there. Speaking of, there we go. All right. Sounds like a DJ Premier beat with him rapping like Ghostface and Hit Boy. It sounds like a Primo beat. I'm like, I wouldn't expect a Primo Ghostface track on a Nas album, but if you're giving it to me, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, Blue Bentley. That's just that's just like that is the up tempo shit on here. Yeah, I actually do song like like I don't want, I don't want people to hear me say I don't like that. I, I Blue Bentley is one of my favorite favorite ones. Like I enjoy that one a lot actually. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the one that's got like it's got the ride factor to it. Quite frankly, yeah, yeah, it's like there's not a lot of shit to ride to on Magic Three. That's two of them. You know what I mean? Like those are the yeah. ones. Like those are literally the two parts of the album where you can just ride to it and not really pay too much attention to what he's saying. And I think that was the intention of them. Yeah. Part of why it makes it the album of the year. It's like no, no, no. It's like we're being so intricate with the writing and with the storytelling and with the message and with the mission. You know, we got to give them a couple records that they can just vibe to. Yeah. Part of making an album of the year. Everything can't be like you know dense and intricate. Yeah. You know. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And so for me, it fits because I feel like Blue Bentley could have been a single too. I feel like it should have been a single because for me, it helps break some of that tone of the album where it's like, boom, story, boom, explanation, boom, story, boom, explanation. It's like you said, it reads out like, I mean, it plays out like a screenplay. Yeah, people's lives have to have parties in them too, right? I was about to say, even in the Godfather Part One, the Godfather Part Part One starts off at a wedding. I mean, he's handling gangster shit in the office, but there's a whole wedding going on outside where people are having fun. Have both. It's like you know, gangsters boogie too. You know, like <laughs> yeah, true story. True story. So it's like for me, it fits. But I have heard people critique those two songs in particular, and yeah. I think also too, it's like in this world of Drake and Future. In toxic love, yeah, it's like that's kind of what we've been conditioned to listen to from our rappers talking about women now, mm -hmm. and so he's kind of talking about it the way a, a mob boss would talk about it. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's kind of lost on people. It's like, no, this is probably like how a wealthy fifty year old bachelor talks. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like most yeah. of the other guys that are talking this way are younger, and they sound younger. Yeah, you know. Man, when he's like long braids, brown eyes, mm -hmm. she about five five. You know, that's the perspective of a fifty year old man, quite frankly, that's single and kind of like is lining everything up before he makes his move, as opposed to the thirty five year old guy that's just like, hey, want fuck? Yeah, you know what he's, I mean. Not setting him up. That sounds bad, but you know what I mean. Like he's 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 getting his game right. Like he's getting all the parts in place. A little, little stalking of the prey going on. Yeah. But that's what I mean. He's like 50. Like, I don't know about you, but it's like. <clears throat> so when you reach a certain age and you are single, which I have been. Mm -hmm. When you reach that place. You do kind of look at women like, OK. Check. 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 OK, let's go. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to the younger version of yourself. You know what I mean? And so there is some there is some of that going on. And I think that's why I understand it. Because I'm not in that place now, but I have been. Yeah. You know? 
where it's like, nah, I want her to be this, 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 and this. Yeah. And like, like I said, like, my, them not landing B is not a, a knock on the songs. That's just like where I am in my life. It just doesn't hit the same way. Like, uh, and it's fine. Like, right. all, all the songs don't have to be for me. I mean, that'd be funny. It's like you're married with three kids. I would hope it's not hitting you that way. Yeah, unless that would be a problem if it were, right? Right. Like if you were if you were feeling and relating to that record on that level, I'd be like, "Is everything okay at home?" <laughs> yeah. Yes, and, and yes, it is. But like it's, but yeah, yeah. But I feel like I feel like they're necessary on this album to give it some tempo and to give it some some music and to give it some you know non intricate feel. Mm-hmm. Like it's not complicated. There was a pretty young girl. It's like literally the simple part of the album. Yeah. Blue Bentley. Like simple. Like that's the simple part of the album. Um It's also the pretty young girls also winking at PYT too. Like in the title and everything else. Like it's correct. correct. It's a that way too, kind of tying back to the Michael and Quincy. I mean, it kind of is pulling right. those and they and they made a song called Michael and Quincy together. So those were some of my thoughts too. Like on the back, on that deeper level of thought, it's like, well, if we're Michael and Quincy, it's like, well, they made PYT. Let's make PYG. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And plus, you can't say you can't. I mean, imagine in today's time, like not being funny, a rapper saying PYT because mm-hmm. what's it stand for? <laughs> yeah. Now tell me how the female populace would take that today. Because to be honest with you, like Mike got away with that shit because he's Mike and it was a different time. You would not get away with that now. Yeah. And so there, there's that level of thought where they're like, well, we can't redo PYT because we live in cancel culture, central era. Right. Right. Um, people love sitting with my thoughts. I love the writing more than I love the record. Yeah. I, I can get behind that too. Like it's, it's not when I listened to it back the last couple of days, like I wasn't paying attention like individual individual tracks. No tears jumped out at me when I was listening, re-listening to it again. Um I liked Wayne's verse on Never Die better than I did the original time. The first times I listened to it, I was kinda like, eh. And and now and the more I listen to it, I'm like, this is and and I, I like it because it's different than anything else on on the album too. Right. That's what I was telling you like that's why it's the feature of the year as opposed to J Cole being the verse of the year because it's totally different than anything else provided to you on an album. Yeah. But, and and this is what I'm saying. So too often, great MCs get together, and the mm-hmm. guy who goes first, the second guy just picks up his cadence and goes. And this is something completely different. This is something completely different. Like, like this is what's beautiful about that record. Mm-hmm. You can hear how great the two individual MCs are separately because they heard the same beat totally differently and it shows yeah. in their rock style and patterns in delivery. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. Like, like, like Wayne's almost like riding, riding like, the drum every other bar. Mm-hmm. You know, Nas is like riding the fucking snare. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they're doing it on the same song. That's what makes it like, oh, like, what a treat. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's really cool to hear because it took me a while to realize that they were riding, they were on the same beat. Like, it was on the same, it, the beat doesn't change from first half to the second half, but they're doing completely different from it. Like, it's like taking the same chord progression and playing wildly different guitar solos. I mean, it's the same right. kind of and, thing. And we've talked a lot about um, like old folk songs or old 12 bar blues songs and that kind of thing about when we talked about other songs before. And the cool part is what people do with it. That's different and new, right? And there's so many thousands of things you can do with it. And when you hear something that's like, Oh, okay. It kind of perks your ear up when you hear something a little new and different because there's so, there's so many roads that are ridden over, over over and over and over and over again. You just kind of like, okay, this is good, but like, whatever. But when you hear something that's a little bit different or somebody's taking something old and, and twisting it a little bit, then that kind of perks, perks my ear up anyway. What's great about the record is that what makes them both icons, yeah. they 
did what made them icons on that record. Like Wayne is no no more for his uncanny delivery. Yeah. Nas is more known for his intricate word usage and wordplay. Guess what they're doing on the song? They both thing. Yeah. They both did what they do well on the song. You know what I'm saying? And people are like, Wayne, you know, got the best of Nas, and it's like I actually think that it's a draw because what I want to hear from a record is. Of, for, for MCs of their stature, which is the highest of the high, these are these are A-listers. Yeah, these are people at the top of the A-list. I want to hear what they do well when you do it together because we don't get that. Like I enjoy I enjoy that Wayne record almost more than any Nas Jay Z pairing because it's like it's too close. It's, yeah, you know they're, they're very different kind of MCs. Like, but the two of them are very different. <laughs> And they're doing, yeah. TJ says I wouldn't mind a few more Nas and Wayne songs. Like I agree. Like that would be <laughs> fun. It'd be a fun thing to hear. No, I would. I would like to hear that more because it was like, man, I was like, I wasn't expecting that to come off that well. Yeah. Like I expect Office Hours with Fifty Cent to go well. Fifty <laughs> is known Nas way before he had a deal, and, and I'm pretty certain no one Nas had something to do with him getting his first deal with Columbia before him and Dre came along. So it's like, no, I expect that record to sound a certain way. It's mm -hmm. like. I expect, you know, Nas to be able to rap well with Lauren Hill. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, I expect that. It's like Wayne. It's like, hmm. It's like fascinating. I hope saw that come up because obviously I saw the the feature like on the list before I ever heard the song. I was like, this is one of those like, I mean, when, when Nas is on this run, you I kind of expect everything to be good. But like, you, it's one of those things that you're like, this is either going to go really well or not. <laughs> And it, right. it did the first. Right. Like, Nas is a, has better spit game on Office Hours, but Never Die is the better song than Office Hours. Yeah. That's one of those I, better than Office Hours. And I don't... Right. Well, there, there's only one real feature on Magic 2, and it's 50. There's only one real feature on Magic 3. That's Wayne. Wayne outperformed 50, and the song is better. I, I buy that 100. No, no. When you ask me like which ones are my favorites, like from B Blue Bentley to the end, or, or, or the one also the other ones that jump out, Blue Bentley, Joe to Speechless, Soul, Bar. like those those four particularly. Um, I mean, I love love this feeling. I love the Marvin sample in that. Um, right. Tisk Tisk has a great mood too. I, I, I like that one. That one, um, it, it landed hard this morning when I re listened to it. Like that's. There's some really, really high highlights on this one, too, honestly. Right. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, like, if we're picking, and I know it's splitting hairs, it's like, no, Fever and Tisk is a better start off than Abracadabra and Office Hours. Yeah. As as a pair, yeah. As a pair, correct. Um, I feel like, I mean, this is, for me, superhero status is the record that I love the least on here, and so I didn't love that it was track three. And yeah. so my complain about the album will probably be that it's like how about this i would like it's fine like it's just not not a bad song on here but it it's not like there's not anything special going on with it for me for it to be at track number three i would have preferred that superhero status and never die with wayne switch places okay i get with that yeah because i also feel like for the pace of superhero status pretty young girl would have picked the pace back up and same thing with based on true events and so it's like because here's the thing, Tisk is really melodic, but it's melodic like it's almost like you want to know what Tisk sounds like to me. It, it borderlines some Wu Tang shit production wise. Okay, you know what I mean. It's like it sounds kind of like grungy and basement, and it's the last record they recorded for this project. Okay, is that the one that's got the uh uh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very like late '90s grunge kind of. There's lots right. of songs that kind of thing in it. Well, I did, right. I did the that one for when I did the reaction for it. There's a song by a band called K's Choice, K apostrophe S Choice, um, called Not an Addict that has an opening that's very similar to that. Where it's going, uh, uh, like that. Um, so it, that, that, I mean, obviously they didn't sample it from that, but it, it has that feel to me. Like it had, it, it brought those memories back for me too. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. But that's one of those things that it's like, <clears throat> they can do anything together. Yeah. Like, that's what's crazy about Magic 3 to me is, is that I don't think they've ever been more in tune with what the other person is doing the way they are on this record. Yeah. Like, 
the way the way that they're kind of like playing off of each other. And that's why I enjoy it so much. It's like for me, and I and I did admit this after listening to it because KD three just has too much heat. KD three is better than Magic three, but the yeah. artist in me enjoys how beautiful they sound playing off of each other on Magic three on KD three. You can tell they had a fucking point to prove. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the best MC. He's the best producer. We're about to make the best songs. And that's what KD3 is. And it's yeah. a solo totally, with no guest appearance. And so all those things matter. But there's something more. There's this, this kind of feels like, this feels more like Michael and Scotty. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, Michael and Scotty, I mean, people that didn't get to see them play together, like, it got to a point where it's like they knew where each other were on the court offensive and defensively so much yeah. that you weren't going to win. It wasn't even like, you know, it's like you weren't going to win. Like, they just knew each other too well. You know what I'm saying? Mike would have the ball right here. He's seeing Scotty cut before all y'all are seeing Scotty cut. You know what I'm he, saying? He would know Scotty was about to cut before he even started moving. Like, it was yeah. – right. Like, Scotty knew when to take the ball and take the ball up the court three or four straight possessions to give Mike a breather so he could finish the game. That's, like, what this shit is like. It's, like, where the relationship is really so seamless that unless you've really been watching the relationship, you don't realize how beautiful and seamless the relationship is. You know, like, you had to watch it. You know what I'm saying? Like, people forget, like, they used to, like, the third quarter of games mm -hmm. during their run, during the third quarter, they'd be waiting for motherfuckers at half court together, like on respective sides of the court yeah. floor. Like Scotty would be at the front and Mike would be back off to him to the left. And then you realize it's like, oh, shit, they're not about to let these motherfuckers score. You know, yeah. that's what this kind of feels like. It's that beautiful relationship of like a team that's won championships together now that know how to win championships, you know. And that's showing everybody else, not how to do it. But here we go again. Right. Right, it's here we go again. It's like we want, like, they didn't always play that way together during the first run. Right. But by the second run came along, you know, both of them had been in the league for so long, their IQs are so ridiculously high. That's what this is more like to me. So this isn't like the early Bulls run. This is like the late Bulls run where it's like, well, they're really winning because they're out thinking everybody. Not yeah. because they're the most athletic anymore. They're not. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? They're just more fundamentally sound. And they know how to get the job done better than these other guys. Like, the Utah team had no business losing to this team back-to-back -back years. Mm -hmm. They were a better team. Yeah, they, they were. better offense. But they didn't know how to win like those two guys knew how to win. To, and the Bulls had the best two players. Like, that's – I mean, Jordan clearly. But, like, Stockton and Malone and Pivot. Like, you can have a conversation about them. But, like um, – I think Stockton's better than Scotty. Historically speaking, I think he is. I think like of, of like career wise, probably. Yeah, um, but, but 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 that's what I mean as far as like closing deals, though. That's what I mean is like what I love about Magic Three is it's like no, they know how to close the deal. Mm -hmm. Like they know exactly what they're doing with each other at this point. You can tell from the the beats. It's like oh no, he's gonna ride this beat like this. This beat was given to him for him to do this. Yeah, you know, and so they're skating, and it's beautiful. Um, it's, it's album of the year, in my opinion, because of those things. Yeah, Magic Two in a vacuum. Magic Two is like the highlight reel. You know what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Yeah, top ten plays on Sports Center. Oh no, that's Magic Two all day. You know, what yeah. I mean, that's that's the one that's getting the highlights, but it's not the. Um, you, you know, how about this? You know, um. A lot of people, I think culturally, reference Scarface mm -hmm. more than Goodfellas or Casino because of the legendary moments on Scarface. Yeah, he, he references Scarface repeatedly on the Magic series, too. Yeah, well, he's been referencing Scarface since The World Is Yours. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been a while. I'm just saying, like, he's pulled it back. I mean, but anybody that's watched Goodfellas or Casino knows those movies are extremely more well written in the end than fucking Scarface, even though Scarface has all the legendary lines. Same thing here, like Magic Two has like all that like high level stuff that you're gonna remember, like a Scarface. But it's not fucking Goodfellas in the end. It's not Casino in the end. The writing's too supreme. The performance 
to Supreme. It's Sharon Stone's best performance. It's one of Joe Pesci's five best performances. It's prime Robert De Niro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with Goodfellas. It's like, no, that's Ray Liotta's best shit. Yeah. That's a top five Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro performance. It's not going to get better than that. Like, Scarface can have the want to play rough and, you know, you know. Sales. Sh- then, yeah. Right. Right. Chichi, get the yayo. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got all that shit, but it's like, it's not better in the end. And that's kind of like the Magic 3, Magic 2 thing to me. It's like, you know. I, I feel that. Yeah. Good that's fellas cool. versus Scarface. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm happy with calling that the album of the year. Yeah. We, we didn't really talk about that compared to to the Boy Genius one, which is uh, one album of the year in the non-hip hop space. I don't know that they're comparable, really. I mean, they are, obviously. I mean, we, we could do that, but like, it's not, they're two completely different things. Well, so. you know, um, we should put up like a mirror music albums of the year post, like, mm-hmm. you know, albums that mirror each other the most, because I think here's what Boy Genius and um, Magic 3 do have in common. They do some of everything on those two albums, respectively. Yeah. And that's how we got to this place. And so, Matic. stylistically, Matic. definitely not the same thing. You know what I mean? And definitely not following the same themes. No. But some of everything in respect and relationship to what they do, which is why yeah. I think we both enjoyed the projects in full so much, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, I, th- I think they're both cinematic in a way, too. I think they're both imagistic. I think they're both... Um, telling stories I think they're both like a series of stories that come together to make a larger story too like I mean I think they both do that um, so yeah it's it's a beautiful it, it was it was a good music year it really was I mean like like I've said this before on on previous shows too like there were several people who had album releases this year that I traditionally have really loved as artists and all of them were mid-ish like they weren't great really like they were just not um the, the the ones that i was expecting to love i i liked okay but i didn't really love and these uh, are the ones well we're mirroring each other once again because it was kind of the same thing over here this year it's like no a lot of dudes dropped through i got like a lot of love for and follow but none of it stuck to my ribs this year to be yeah. perfect honest with you like it didn't it did like you landed but it didn't stick you know what i'm saying it's kind of like um it's like when a gymnast gets off the balance beam and they do the little before they stick the landing instead of sticking the landing that's how i felt about the album this year it's like no no, no i like what you're doing i appreciate it, but i just saw you i just saw you bend a little bit so i'm about to take some points off yeah yeah like uh jeezy made a project that i enjoyed this year but it's like within two or three weeks i wasn't listening to it i'm a big jeezy fan um yeah. Currency and Jermaine Dupri made an album together. It's like, no, I really enjoyed the album. I wasn't listening to it a month later. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the two, the, like, uh, Alice Phoebe Lou, Boy Genius are the two that I kept coming back to, right? And there are plenty of albums that I liked, but those were the ones that I listened to over and over. And, like, I, and both of those came out, one came out in, like, June, May, June, one came out in, like, February, March. And I kept, I'd put them up for a month and I'd come back to them over and over and over again. Right. Like, and that's, that's one of those marks of, of a great album to me is that it makes me want to keep coming back to it. Right. Right. I mean, that is part of the draw and that's why it's like, no, give me Larry June's uh, albums. The one with Alchemist, the one with Cardo, give me killer Mike, give me the two Nas project. It's like, well, that's the shit that stuck with me. Jay Steve's album stuck with me for a while too. So, but there weren't like, you know, I usually, usually when I'm making these year end lists, I'm literally usually like racking my brain. Like, okay, hold on. Like, and when I mean I'm racking my brain, I'm talking about like picking album 12, like figuring out the difference between album number 12 and album number 17. You know what yeah. I'm saying? This year it was like, man, they kind of made my life easy this year. It's like, man, it's this, 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 this. And then the rest of it's kind of just okay. You know, I'm a big Conway. My top, my top three or four or whatever were like, uh, so like, yeah. a, like Conway made. Conway is one of my favorite MCs and one of the best MCs of this era. And his won't he do it album? I mean, like, it just didn't do it for me like his albums normally do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's not like it's a bad project. It's like, no, I'm still a big fan of his. I'm still a big fan of Griselda. 
He's he's yeah. uh to me, in my opinion, he would be in the upper echelon MCs of this era, along with uh, Cole and mm-hmm. Nas and Black yeah. Thought. Like I believe he deserves to be in wow. that. I believe he b- deserves to be in that catalog. But the album didn't stick. The Black Thought album didn't stick for me, Andrew. Uh, the Black Thought album. And some of that for me, I mean, I love The Glorious Game. That's one of the ones I listen to over and over again, too. But, like, the cheat codes when I came back to over and over. And this one is, it didn't hit. I mean, uh-huh. it was, it was like, just like you said, it was good, but it wasn't, like, it didn't, like, grab me in the same no, way. I've told people my problem with Glorious Game is cheat codes. That's exactly it. Yeah. Because I would rather listen to, like, I, that's the one I came back to. Right. It's like, how about this? I think. It, I'd probably feel different about Gloria's game, even if it was dropping like right about now. But it came too close after Cheat Codes. It's like I was still playing Cheat Codes when Gloria's game came out. And, and when I hear shit about pairing them a little bit, and it's like, it's, you can't help it. I'm still playing No Gold Teeth and Aquamarine. And believe, you know what I'm, yeah. it's like when I play Aquamarine, I'm like, nah, where's that shit at on here? Yeah, where's No the, Gold Teeth at on. Here? The Gloria's game is great beginning to end to me, but it it doesn't have moments that like jump out at you like could right. i name any of the songs on glorious game now no i can't i, can, I can't do it from memory Correct. I can, That's what i mean like these like i can name them off yeah first. the hardest part with raekwon like that's what i'm saying is it's like oh no i know these records yeah yeah so yeah okay, she, she, one of my very favorite things like and yeah. and who knows this we have not talked about it much on this show because we haven't really covered the roots but like black thought is one of very favorites. Like, Me too. Top, top, top of them. Me yeah. too. I've I've told people, you know, prior to this Nas run, the walking standard for bars. Mm-hmm. And he still might be that in a lot of ways. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's conversation. Sure. Look, I gotta I gotta slide up out of here. Yeah, you gotta you gotta take side of work. I understand. So yeah. it's been it's been a good conversation though. Um thanks okay. y'all hanging out with us um like and share and subscribe make sure that you're sending this on to other people that you think would enjoy it um send us a dollar if you want to um and we'll see y'all next time well i think we're planning on doing next saturday i don't know what we're going to do but we'll cover that this weekend right i mean because the year's kind of starting too we got to see if somebody actually drops some fucking music or maybe we'll kind of like maybe we'll do some root shit you know what i'm saying i I would love to talk about some root shit that would be good love the roots yeah yeah so appreciate the love, appreciate the support. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy Great New Year. Year. Take uh, care. See you next time. Yes, sir.